Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Speculative Speculations. I'm Varsha. I'm Steve. And I'm Chris. And this is a sci-fi podcast where we talk about sci-fi stories in all their forms. Currently, we are going to be working our way through the short story collection, Stories of Your Life by Ted Chang. Today's discussion will be uh, on the story of your life, which is the short story that the movie Arrival was based on, which seemed like a good place to start. Uh, Over the next few weeks, we will be making our way through the rest of this book. For next week, we will be discussing Tower of Babylon and Division by Zero, which are also two stories in this short story collection. Uh, If you and uh, we'll <laughs> lay out a schedule as we go and we'll do all our planning on the Patreon forum. So if you'd like to join us for this or any other discussions, please consider checking out that forum. So um, what did you guys think of the story? I loved every minute of it. Mm. Uh, how did it go for you? Chris, go ahead. So uh, I, I think there's a lot to talk about it, even though it was kind of what a bit hard to read, something around mm-hmm. that. It was a bit hard to read. Uh, I, I think the things that I really loved about it, I love the structure of it. I love the blending of the, what is the sci-fi element to it, mm-hmm. to the parody element of it. I think that's really important for creating, taking away some of the barrier of entry for people. So mm-hmm. it would tell, you know, a, a kind of linguistic, kind of almost very scientific, kind of in-depth kind of concept. Mm-hmm. And I often found, oh God, I think I get that. And then they would do an allegory with parenting and kind of give you another example of it. It was almost mm-hmm. like uh, I was being taught uh, as yeah. well as being instructed and, <laughs> and that kind of stuff. And I, and I think I think those elements, as that happened more and more, uh, it never felt forced, but it always mm-hmm. felt interesting. You know, it, it never was the same type of example used again and again, and it was never kind of led out and also then the time aspect of that, that the way it was sort of running backwards as well uh, i think there's a lot going on in terms of structure and narrative uh build up of the story that, that was super interesting yeah i definitely agree and I, and I think there's a lot to talk about in each of those elements that you pointed out chris what did you think steve well, I'm a big fan of the movie. Well, the movie always gets me at the end, so it's not a movie I like to watch very often because it always gets me at the end. <laughs> and this story did get me at the end, too. I just finished a little bit ago. And it did, I didn't expect it to, but it, it got to me um, at the very end. So a couple of things. I think the main character annoyed me a little bit. She seemed really flippant at the beginning. Like, there's mm. just these extraterrestrials kind of just hanging out, and she seems really casual about the whole thing. Um but I guess that's to her character. Um, but it, some of the scientific stuff I kind of glossed over. I felt like it got a little bit too, maybe. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of felt like there was some of that. Do we really need all of that? I don't know. It just seemed, it was interesting, but it's like, okay, what is this adding to the story, really? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, overall, I did enjoy the story. Um, but I just felt like there was, there was some portions that I just kind of lost interest in it a little bit. That makes sense. I think um, I this book, well, it reminds me of a couple of other books for some different reasons. One, um, I kind of wish I could figure out how I would read or react to this book if I hadn't watched the movie. I had the same feeling about The Prestige as well, because the reveal is so brilliant. If you go <laughs> in knowing what's going to happen, I think... I understood a lot more than I probably would have on a first read or I connected a lot more things than, again, I probably would have (laughs) if I hadn't known. So just the reading experience I wish had been, I could mildly raise my memory a little bit (laughs) of having seen the movie. And then the other book that it reminded me of was The Martian. I watched and loved the movie, but the additional science in the book I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Like there's a whole section in the book where he chases a storm and he uses trigonometry (laughs) and whatnot to triangulate the location. And it was brilliant. Um, So this one, I think the additional detail into... Now, I don't know if he's using the calculus of variations in a way that makes sense, but I was convinced (laughs) with as much (laughs) scientific background as I do have. I was convinced that it does. So, um, yeah, I feel like that 
I really enjoyed the additional bits that that I felt like explained things in the movie that not that I didn't understand, but it made it feel like it could make more sense with this. Yeah, I I think the the point that the, the story is trying to make by the end of it, I think for all of the high concept science that he does try and use and and, and kind of explain those kind of exploratory conversations between the two of them about kind of theoretical physics and kind of practical physics, the way that people see it uh, or otherwise, it kind of brought down into a very simple concept, and that is the idea of you know planning for things to happen if you if you don't know where you're going. You know, and then mm. that, that I think that that at the very core is what the story is about. And you can dress it up in all the science that you want. You can use refraction of rays. You can use the water slowing mm -hmm. down. I think the way that they ended up doing it worked in retrospect. But mm -hmm. I think reading it at the time, I think it's probably what you were talking about a little bit, Steve. It's kind of like, uh, okay, I think I think I know what's going on there. You know, it, it doesn't quite work at the time, but sort yeah. of works towards the end. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, yeah, it does. I think. So here's my question. We find out almost, and I think this short story brings up a question that wasn't necessarily obvious, but I think was applicable to the movie, the question of free will, and I should, we should probably talk about that a bit. But um, we, I think uh, in the movie, we find out about the daughter towards the very end, right? Mm -hmm. And we got that in the pretty much in the beginning of all of this. So did that change your experience of the story in any way? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I thought it was really interesting because I definitely started off the story kind of very distracted by the movie, very distracted mm -hmm. by the look of the movie, the look of trying to match up the words to the visuals that they were put in the movie. But knowing what way the movie pays off at the end kind of left me free to explore the other elements of the story that weren't that if that makes sense mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so the the reveal of the, of the daughter towards the end of the story being up front in the book kind of worked to that to that end because mm -hmm. i could just sit and go right what else is this story about thematically rather than kind of like what feels like a big emotional payoff in the movie mm -hmm. like what the movie's building towards it's very much about that whereas in this it's just kind of a plot point that kind of you know the, isn't the last line of, of the story is very much about them deciding they're going to do it at the end in much the same way as the film sort of does in a lot of ways but it's all it's, it's been very clear that that's where it's going and it's very clear what kind of relationship and who it was and all of that kind of stuff so it meant everything else that happened about the build up of the relationship with the tetrapods and you know the outside influence and what mankind wanted out of that sort of encounter was much more interesting to me and i wasn't kind of wondering about this other aspect of where why is why are they using the parenting aspect and like going yeah. back in time that i think that would have been very distracting if i hadn't seen the film beforehand that i could mm -hmm. concentrate on other things so. hmm. Hmm. interesting yeah yeah it is interesting if you hadn't seen the movie it yeah, that, that's that's one of the reasons why I really wish I could have read it before the movie because, yeah, it it would have been I can imagine very confusing. But to be honest, I still don't. Yeah, I guess the point that it's making is about you know would you decide to make the same choices if you knew how everything was going to play out, or maybe even saying you don't have a choice but not to make the same choices, but. Um yeah, that that I can see how that would have been very confusing to go back and forth with just the interactions with the child. It yeah, yeah. But I guess it, it suits a reread, right? If you finish this yeah. I, I'm not sure if it <laughs> if if the movie's helping the story or if the story helps itself. <laughs> I think we talked about this previously when we were reading the um, Ken Liu short stories, like the Paper Menagerie. Remember back to the reading sprints that you used to do, mm -hmm. Steve? Uh, and, and talking about the fact that writing short fiction like this or short stories like this is a real skill. Mm -hmm. You know, it is not just enough to kind of plant a whole lot of like a simple story down on a page and for it to work, because it seems to me similarly to Ken Liu that what you were saying about rereading you know the thematic stuff and the ideas that swim around here they're almost all thought pieces 
uh, mm. that use some sort of clear narrative and conventional storytelling to kind of float these these thematic ideas in there, so that when you do finish it, you're left to ruminate. Well, it was sort of about a mother, daughter, father, mm-hmm. and an alien kind of invasion kind of coming there, but it's really not about that. That's just sort of the setup for the ideas that the, the one that they convey. And I'm, I'm always fascinated to know what comes first. Yeah. Do you come up with the thematic ideas and say, I want to make the story about this, or this is the idea that I want to explore, and then think, right, how can I formulate that into sort of some sort of narrative and create a fantastic element to it? Or do you go, right, I've got this idea of, right, if they came down, do the themes come out of that? And I always think that's that's... Hmm. Uh, that that's the bit that I can't as a as a reader hmm. put inside the head of an author and say, and I'm sure there are people that do it from both sides. They often say about the panther panther versus the the plotter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure there's as many do it from one side as the other one, but it seems to me like Chiang and you do something very similar. Even though I've only read one of the stories out of this collection, rather as opposed to the other one, the kind of uh, this kind of idea of I could read that again and kind of quiet different parts or resonate with different parts the time after time mm. yeah it, there are stories that make you think a lot though i think this was even when we were reading the kennedy stories we were talking about how much each one made us think and i think mm. this could send us in five different directions <laughs> no problem uh, mm. did that there, there is a note i don't know if you guys looked at the um short story notes at the end of the book mm. but no. there's one for each of the short stories and the note for this one he said that um he found the principles of variational calculus interesting but he figured out how to use them when he saw a performance of time flies when you're alive which mm-hmm. is apparently a one-man show about uh paul Link's uh um wife's battle with cancer uh-huh. mm. Yeah, so I guess <laughs> he had the idea and then figured out how to apply it with this. Yeah, but I, I thought it was interesting that you brought that up because this is one case where we do have some information from the author about how uh, how the thought process went. Hmm. I, I did like the exploration of time and whether it's fate or it's been determined. And if we know the future, will we just go about it? to make that future ultimately happen? Do we even, would we change anything or just keep going and, and just repeat over and over again? Uh, but I did like that exploration of time and I never really thought of the whole light travels through water and to determine how long it would take to go through the water to get from point A to point B. So I did, I did enjoy all that. I just, uh, the time travel stuff or the, not the time travel, but the time, I love stories with time and with, um, you know, with, if if it's all happening at once, or it's linear, or what what is time? I love stories that explore uh, time. Hmm. I I do too. I think that's one of the reasons why I like uh, Christopher Nolan's movie so much because he plays with time so much. But um, anyway, <laughs> this did. Sorry, Chris, were you saying something? No, I, I was just going to comment on on the idea of the of the time plan backwards and forth, and that. He was playing with time, but he was doing things that were very normal to people. I, I still think the purpose of that part of the story was to make it relatable and mm. kind of take some of the, the the big scientific concepts that he has in there and not make sure people don't get lost with it. And kind of because they kept on coming back to things that I think a lot of people can relate to, which is the teenagers not speaking to them. The teenagers yeah. having basically unrealistic demands of of a parent so who were, you know, kids not that so long ago, these imperfect human beings. And even taking it back to when they're very, very young and the reliance of the mother and the parent and, and then the kind of questions that 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 come out of all of those. And you know, at at while that concept of time going backwards, it kind of it does create that that point. And this is where I'm influenced by the movie. It creates that point of singularity at the time, you know, with the, the kind of end is the middle of the story. Mm-hmm. If, if that makes sense mm-hmm. um uh, as like a finishing point to like kind of giving it a, a, a bit of closure and so far as the, the stories converging from two two points uh coming back to the point of conception then or the idea of conception probably rather than mm. uh, getting any detail uh, but but the rest of it but 
Yeah, it's interesting to see how he writes a sci-fi story in terms of using time, but I think the time is for to be less scientific, if that makes sense. Hmm. Be more relatable. Hmm. I guess they serve the purpose of being relatable or making the story more accessible, uh, or like so you have a break between the scientific explanations. But did you also read it as her getting familiar with the language, with the heptapod language, is sort of giving her flashes into her future. Hmm. There was a line um, in it, I forget exactly, it was towards the beginning when she first starts communicating with them and says something about when uh, she had a, a flash of when they ruled or when, and I wondered if that, because I, I thought, Maybe this won't be like the movie and they'll they'll take over or something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh but I, I did wonder about that if if she was saying she was seeing their history too, like they were sharing time with her or their memories mm -hmm. of her. So I but I wasn't sure about that. I don't know if I just read too much into that. Mm. I've only really thought about this, but the fact that she's an expert linguist and can communicate with kind of and create systems and see systems for communicating with alien races seemed to me be far easier than trying to create a linguistic or a way to communicate with her own child actually over the course of the story uh that she struggles so much with identifying with the older version of 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 her child as opposed to the child and kind of as as again that point of convergence at the end where she kind of got to the point where she could communicate with the the heptopods uh was it with the time she could communicate with her child and those mm -hmm. two and as we went away further away from that part the start and the end of other teenage life or otherwise uh, she couldn't communicate with, with either of them um yeah that that is that is an interesting perspective it i i guess there's more systematism to her communication with the mm. heptapods and less emotion to deal with with the child um yeah, I guess uh, Flapper and Raspberry won't hurt her feelings. <laughs> well, there were moments of revelation with the, the, the communicating an alien race, whereas there's no moments of revelation with her thing. It's more just an acceptance yeah. uh, from her point of, uh, what if, what, isn't it the joke that says, uh, the joke in the book, what if, your, what if your child goes up and blames you for everything that they've done wrong in their life? <laughs> says, what do you mean? <laughs> what, what if? <laughs> What do you mean if? Yeah. <laughs> I like everybody can relate to, yeah. Yeah. I do uh, like the design mm -hmm. of the creatures too, that they aren't typical mm -hmm. length, you know, long or short, that the, uh, you know, oval face. I did like that there were these really like, you know, these uh, limbs that were like, kind of like, like hanging in the air and they look like barrels. So I did like that about it too, that they didn't, they didn't really have lips. They couldn't really communicate. Um, so yeah, I think that, uh, that part I did enjoy too, that they're different because it's too easy. Yeah. And they have seven eyes. I, uh, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess a detailed lesson of their anatomy that I didn't necessarily need. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and how they eat. So. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I do actually have a problem with the story, though. Mm -hmm. So, I think the story only works if the aliens are experts. Mm. I think there is, obviously, linguistic experts from, from the humanities point of view are trying to relate with them. But they're asking for quite, like, if you took Joe Bloggs off the street and even like a pretty well educated person off the street and put them in an aircraft to go to another place only certain people are going to understand the physics aspect of it and maybe that's part of the reason why they couldn't understand they couldn't relate to the physics part of it but i don't think that's the point that ted chang was trying to make and it. it was like that they sought or they thought of physics in a different way it is you know conceptually mm -hmm. Uh, but if you were questioning somebody just, especially because there's all these pods all over the world, they would have had to know quite a lot or be very well educated to be even have that conversation in the first place. Mm. And you sort of need to suspend your disbelief that even if they took astronauts who are quite very well educated off Earth 
and put them in that situation, a lot of them would be looking at each other going, oh, it's not my, ex- my area of expertise. I'm a bit lost here. I, I don't know if I could do it. Well, we could see that, there were, that humanity brought in experts, but they had everybody to pick from the planet as opposed mm. to just these kind of couple of pods that, that arrived um, and Pluto the Earth. So I, I kind of was like, ah, if you think about that bit too much, that sort of creates some problems. But then they didn't explore the motivations of why the aliens were there at all and they purposely kind of left that to the side and kind of went, that's, oh, uh, we don't know. We just don't know. We don't know about them. <laughs> so why do you both think they came? Why, why do you think they were there? Or does it matter, I guess, is another question. Mm. <laughs> I think the so to what Chris said, there is a potential solution, which I think would answer your question to Steve, but uh, it depends on whether okay, so first I feel like this story is making a point that it addressed, but I also feel like maybe semi glossed over the question of free will and choice. And um, I think the solution to to the problem you brought up, Chris, could be that, uh, I don't know, I don't know at what point a heptapod becomes completely aware of its future, maybe as soon as it's born. Oh, so yeah. it, it, the, what, um, Louise, is that the name of the main character? She says that conversation for them is performative. They are just That's executing right. a script that was pre-written for them. <laughs> But that leads to the question of, okay, why? <laughs> for humans, I think the answer is different for humans. They perceive time differently. They are existing, I suppose. And they, I, I wonder, is it clear whether they experience time sequentially as well, or if they just perceive simultaneously, but they, but their experience is still sequential because like, then the question that you brought up, Steve, does it really matter? It depends on whether you think <laughs> it's still worth plowing through everything and caring about anything if all choice is taken away from you. So and and I feel like that that has to be the conclusion of the story, right? If you have it doesn't matter who if you have an alien species that's able to determine the entirety of its lifespan. If, if it's able to perceive it to that extent, then you're not really taking actions. And by extension, I think nobody can take actions that influence anything. You're just, everybody's acting out a script, right? Like the existence of one <laughs> means nobody has free choice. Some big questions there. I mean, yes, you are right in terms of that's right from their perspective, but the whole idea of science in general is that things will continue to travel in a straight line unless they are interfered with by outside forces, which yeah. in this case they could perceive to be humanity. So while they are aware of their own existence and what will happen in their lifetime, maybe they are exploring what the possible effect of another species would have would have on them. Is that mm. they're in a fact finding mission to kind of take that bit of information to understand about these people so that they can then build that into whatever way they perceive that their, their future is going to be. And once they have that information, then they can go ahead and do. But not knowing, there's no way they can do it just by observing alone, by using the same logic. They have to test it and probe it and kind of find find out about it, find out what they know, whether it's in terms of like knowledge or whether it's in the act of gift giving, as, as, as was kind of explored, what what do they kind of consider to be important? What mm. do they consider to be not important? Who do they get to deal with it? What are the motivations of these people? All those things would need to be explored as to create some sort of certainty or some sort of better probability, probability outcome mm. uh, for how, they, how the outside forces might influence their own determination. So is this their gift that they were giving? The ability to see, to see time? Because if they if they know if they know they see their whole lives they know they know the destination the they know the sentence before they start writing the sentence they know that they're coming to Earth they know that they're going to interact with her they know that they're going all this stuff is already known to them so and they're there just to observe then are they just spreading this way of thinking this because you we think about time and it's all it's 
we, we think about time as like linear, but we think, is it just, are we just seeing the surface of the water and they mm. see that it's, there's underneath that we're just looking at a, a, at a, at a bug floating on the top of the surface of the water and they see it as they're, they're swimming in it. Um, is that their gift to spread this around to, to see time the way they do and to, for, and, and if so, then why, why her to help her grieve because if she needs, she's grieving and she, um, to give her a different person. I don't know. I mean, but mm. it seems like if, if it's all predetermined, then okay. That they know that they were going to come here they know they're going to talk to her. They know that she's going to communicate with them. She'll see time in this way. She'll, so why? Or does it, is there a reason for it? Is it just because chance that it, they just happened to, that's what's ha just yeah, got lucky? Or I don't know, is it is it lucky to see time like that? I don't know. Is it a curse? Is it, would you want to see time that way if you could? If you had the choice, would you want to? I think as humans, it would be very difficult because I think if we know what comes, we would be purposely stepping out of our way to change those outcomes. So I think that's very in the nature of of who humanity is and how they've kind of progressed, especially in the 20th century and beyond has kind of been very much, how can we change yesterday today uh, in some way, whether through technology or, or whatever way we're going about it. But I'm sort of confused as to, as to how that whole knowing the past span of your life, but also needing to actuate it or actually have it happen for it to for you to understand it it's i suppose it's that idea i think it's, isn't it plato's f philosophical concept which is that we don't actually learn anything through our life we already we are born with the knowledge of everything and moments and things that are said to us unlock the, the knowledge within each of us inherently rather than us actually accruing knowledge which is the way that a lot of us think and it's exactly the same ideas they're talking about the the light rays in the water as well you know it's kind of looking up from both sides do we know everything and it's unlocked by the moments or do we accrue in the linear sequential fa fashion um from one to the end and i think it takes that same idea in both cases you need moments to happen you need things to happen to you to be able to gain the knowledge either way you look at it whether that's sequentially or not so i'm i I think the book was a pains to kind of not make a judgment call to say oh it definitely means this or definitely means the other thing rather than kind of say we think there's the possibility hmm. Hmm. yeah but I, I i agree i think that's why i i mean i use the word gloss and I, but what i mean is that i guess he tried to uh discuss it to a certain extent but not draw any conclusions but hmm. It is my opinion that the conclusion is pretty clear. I don't know if you guys <laughs> agree, but if you have, maybe it depends on what kind of beings these, like maybe we need to know more about the perception through time, but let's say, like forget about the heptapods, but <laughs> what are some variants of perception through time that would still allow for free will for it all not to be like from the beginning of the universe to the end of time everything's determined and this is exactly how it is going to go so like what is the point of like or is sentience even a thing <laughs> in that case right like i feel like the version of uh time perception that's in the story does not allow for free will but like that's open to discussion. What what do you both think, or is there a variation on this perception that would still allow for free will? Hmm. I don't know that there is free will if this is because if it's all pre if, if there's a certain path that you're going to take, is there free will? And if you can see everything, would you just naturally want to make those things happen? Would it just be like a a natural reaction to it to to want to get to those different goalposts and make that vision reality or would you change it and i mean could could we change i mean because i know we all wish like, i wish i can go back and change that but when you when you have distance and perspective and you look back and you say well that was a really terrible thing that happened but it made me a better person in the end right i think we've can all say we've gone through some terrible things everybody has mm -hmm. and look, after some time and some healing and you know you look mm. back and say, you know, I'm, it's it was really hard, but I'm I'm glad I went through it because I learned a lot and I'm I'm better because of it. 
you know, I've, I've, so if you could go back and erase those things, even if they were hard and difficult to go through, would you really do it? Mm. it? Is it that if you know that this is the outcome and you didn't end up in a horribly bad place? Right. Well, of course, yeah. Yeah, you, <laughs> the alternative, you don't know where that will go. So maybe you end up choosing where you go. So it's not that you don't have a choice and that it's all predetermined. Maybe, maybe it's a comment on finding comfort in knowing and acting on whatever the possible future is. Yeah. I think I just don't believe it at the end of the day. I don't think there's such a thing as a predetermined state. I just uh, There's just no way to possibly I, at a very core level i just i just don't think it's possible but even though you know the whole idea of science fiction is you sort of postulate kind of ideas and then kind of explore it like that's literally the whole point of it um but uh, and i think that's again explored throughout this the the story in terms of the the light refracting yeah you know and the, and the way it's refracting to say look people believe this and other people believe this i definitely think this is true but I can see how the observed thing, people will never be able to be shaken from the idea that this is happening. And, you know, then it says some of the effect of, it depends on what way you look at it, really. Mm. And just kind of leave it at that without being saying, no, I'm going to make sure you understand this before you leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> because it is yeah. theoretical, I suppose, at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I, I don't like the idea or even don't believe in predetermination that everything is happening exactly the way it's supposed to but um yeah it is an interesting question to explore through this story i think since it brought up um the question the uh, other thing that i really really liked mainly because of how it meshed with the other themes that were explored were how the writing the way the heptapods wrote meshes with their perception i love this notion of building a sentence like just using one piece of graphic and then building the whole sentence into that because that captures simultaneity so beautifully i thought that was really imaginative <laughs> i love that whole bit i think us type of anybody that likes like reading science fiction is going to like that part of it, uh, likes the kind of sequential nature of that and how that build up and how the discovery kind of builds on page and page and page. Uh, it's sort of like as a very rewarding payoff, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, in terms of like, oh yes, so th this is how clever you've got to show that this this Louise is clever and knows what she's doing and all of that kind of stuff. She she, she knows what's that. She she'll be able to work this out. Um, but, like, could you work all that out? That's that's the bit that I, that I sort of struggle with in terms of, like, okay, looking at rotation, I went, like, that seems all a bit of a leap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, this was in 2002, right? I don't know. I, was it? Yeah, I think it was written in 2002 or was it 98? But I don't think um, machine learning had gotten to a point where you could run all of this to, um, or it wasn't so commonly in use as far as I know it hadn't gone to that point yet and um, so yeah she apparently detected all of this manually all the analysis it it does seem a bit slightly far-fetched perhaps but like maybe she's but but they are uh, so I think one thing to note is that there are 112 locations and there are 112 mm -hmm. presumably very expert linguists all working on this together so maybe the common the hive mind <laughs> worked it all out together if this happened today would they just put it like would they just give it to ai and hope that it works out <laughs> rather would, than the person i would think so like i mean i guess you have to closely monitor the algorithms but i i would imagine that that would be a very significant tool in doing yeah. the processing analysis yeah yeah it did grunt work so to speak i i also wonder if this actually did happen mm. i'm pretty sure this is not the approach that would be taken no this kind of unified <laughs> let's get oh. the scientists in and let them give them free reign and listen to them is not what would happen 
uh, yeah. at all. It is just no, the sad yeah. tells us that's very much the uh, the case. The, the brief mention of the colonel taking, um, they're rolling their eyes at the colonel and stuff. I'm like, mm. it, there's no way they're only meeting <laughs> this infrequently to uh, get status updates. But I suppose they are being monitored, and they have um, they have a video camera there to make sure that they don't communicate anything to the aliens that they aren't supposed to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think Steve earlier you brought up a question of uh, why her. Uh, I wanted to talk about that a bit more. I did. Did you get the impression that she seemed? selected somehow i the um there was one other linguist who was apparently learning this language as uh, closely as she was that she was familiar with and was working with so i guess this is just the story of this person i don't know if this uh was a chosen person as such but i guess this is how she used her knowledge if that makes sense mm -hmm. of the language Yeah. The um what else? There was Yeah. <laughs> so, did you um think again, I think speaking of things that we got from the movie that I tracked pretty early on, I think there were some significant details that felt like, oh, they're referencing the fact of their simultaneous perception in time pretty early on in the story. Were there, like, that was the one <laughs> aspect that I was most interested in. And so um, I, I th th those were the bits that I noticed the most. What Were there any other things that you noticed because you knew the story, how the story goes ahead of time? I think one of the things that really jumps out to me is, I know he's very famed for it, but how brilliant is Denny Villeneuve and his team in tra translating a story like this onto the screen as effectively as they did? Because they pretty much did communicate a lot of the high concept stuff very well visually mm -hmm. in what is like incredibly difficult to do. And I'm sure the, well, I mean, almost certainly what happened was people re went and read the story after watching arrival and went oh crap this mm. might be the first person that could do june you know that that kind of idea uh, the, the how do you film the unfilmable um, whatever whatever that word is uh, how do you take really high concept sci-fi stuff that very much flows in the page from one bit to the next that only sort of works if you know a bit about science you know, or a bit about language or about how it goes, you put that together, which is easier in books because obviously anybody that's reading sci-fi book is sort of in mm -hmm. it and knows mm -hmm. what they're, they're, they're invested in, whereas a movie is supposed to be for everybody. You know, mm -hmm. anybody can turn mm -hmm. up and watch that and, and, and make, and be, for that to be made sense of is, is kind of extraordinary uh, how he took what was an hour's reading and turned it into a, a two-hour movie <laughs> and built in some parts of it kind of simplified other parts of it and made it sort of all work. I, I'd sort of blown away by by how skilled that mm. was. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. The um, So, yeah, it, it's interesting. The, the bits that were taken out, uh, like the thing about the calculus of variations and... So they discovered, once again, in the story pretty early on about the simultaneous time perception thing, which in the movie isn't really revealed until the very yeah. end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I forget what the trigger was which helped them understand um, how they perceive everything simultaneously. But I, I really love the build-up in the story about this is how they write and this is how they perceive science so let's put those things together and figure out that this is how they perceive their world that was pretty interesting to me do you both like it better with it being drawn out rather than a re uh, rather than like a reveal at the end because I, I think i'm i'm 
and I try to not let my my movie experience, my movie watching experience, in, influence my preferences. But I think it's it worked better for me when it was a reveal at the end. Mm-hmm. I think it was more of a surprise. Like it, it felt more impactful because it wasn't because on the, on the we know certain things pretty fast. But I think it hit it hits harder when it comes all at once. But then again, it does build dread and tension throughout the story because you're waiting to see what's going, like, how are we going to get to that end point? So it, not that there's a right or wrong way. They're, they're both, they both have their merits, but I think personally, I, I prefer the reveal at the end. This, this feels more like a flood all at once instead of a trickle. Mm. Yeah. I think conceptually the two things, the two, diff- the two stories, even though the same stories are about very different things. I mean, the movie is about the reveal. He made it about that, about, I mean, there's an existential threat it's that idea of the pods landing and what are, what do they want? What do they need? Mm-hmm. That was kind of the point of that, of the, the story. And then they use that as a vehicle then to have that tension and you think it's about that one thing and reveal it about something else, make it a very human story at, at the end of it. Whereas the, the story it is not about the threat so much. The military hardly play a part in this story at all. It's very much about the exploration of, of time, of mm-hmm. kind of these phys- physical concepts uh that we kind of postulated and, and kind of thought about and, and the reader kind of going on that journey and mm-hmm. using the dual storyline for something different in, in that case uh, which story do you prefer better i mean i think i prefer i think i prefer the movie as well because it has a climactic endpoint to it mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. But I, I, it's sort of what makes it, like, back to what Varsha said at the start, and so it makes a reread of this kind of very interesting because you can go in and say, okay, do I need to read the book or read the story, watch the movie, go back and read the story again and, uh, and to really appreciate actually what, what they're doing differently or, or, or not. Mm. Yeah. I I do, I I agree with you, Chris. I think I experience them differently and I can't say that I have a preference for one or the other. I can see how the movie wouldn't work if they told us everything. And so the the big reveal in the story, so to speak, is uh, if you knew everything you were going to do, would you still make all the same choices? I, I guess that's the biggest question that we're probably meant to be thinking about here. Uh, if, and yeah, there are some sidetracks along the way about, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had being so good perceive everything that would happen in their lifetime simultaneously and how we got there. That's really interesting. But the big reveal in the story is, I think, not even addressed or touched upon in the movie. So they are they feel like completely different stories in that regard with regard to the point they are making I suppose well actually ultimately I think the movie also kind of does a very similar thing Uh, I almost thought from the movie that her husband left her because she knew that the child was going to die and I for some reason thought that the child was going to be very young when she died not 25 but that he didn't want the trauma so he left her like left them I think that was probably completely a misinterpretation on my Mm -hmm. Part, but it it did kind of ultimately make that point. But the thing about the simultaneity of time, I did kind of like going on that exploration with her, and it's to ask the same big question at the end. So, yeah, I I can't say that I prefer one over the other. I I just loved both of them very similarly. But did you? So, Steve, you said that. Um, the movie got you in the end and the book got you too so do you want to talk a little bit about what (laughs) about the ending (laughs) uh, affects you so much well i think it's just it's i think it goes back to kind of uh, i forget the um the film with jim carrey and um uh kate winslet uh oh yeah kind of the same thing is is um Mm. you know we Yes, the end or the the daughter's death was a terrible loss, but it was still, still all these other great memories of her growing up and her getting older and um, interacting with her and spending time with her. 
So even though you know that she's going to die, you'll still live those 24, 25 years with her just because of all the wonderful times you had. So that's what it really gets me at the end of the, it got me at the, in the end of the movie and the last uh, few, the last half a page of this one really was like, oof, it got me, mm-hmm. <laughs> damn you. <laughs> but it, it does raise the question though, that if you, it, and I think it asks the question slightly differently in the book, this is what I'm saying. So if you could relive your life again, if you somebody would reset you back to even when you were 16, 17 years of age, I said, Would you like to do the same things all over again? I think a natural inclination of humanity is to go, No, no, well, I've already lived that. But I think the point the book's trying to make is the fact that you haven't lived them yet. Hmm. If you had to experience, experience these things for the first time, would you give up the experiences and, and things that you've made in order to live a different life? And I think that's a very different question because the first question. You definitely don't want to do the same thing again. You want to relive the same thing. But the second one is like very, very strong for all the good and the bad that happens. I think mm. most people would say, no, I'll just do do what I did again. And you could never relive it, right? If you could relive it, if you had a chance to just to go through all those different choices again, you're going to make a choice that was different. One little change, whether you hit the snooze button for one time too many times and you got in a car accident you know, or whatever it is, um, it could change the trajectory of your life. So if you relived it, would you really be able to relive it and be in the exact same place? It would be, it had to be different. Mm. So is it, is it more that if you have more than this is what your life looks like and you have to follow all the beats, is it that if this is your end goal, these are all the beats you will necessarily follow that it's always going to be the <laughs> minimized or maximized path. And this is the differentiated curve of your uh, life. Or is it, um, is it that, yeah, maybe that that's it. Like if you want to end up in a different place, you have different perception and you make different choices. Yeah. That, I like that. I like that as the conclusion to, is everything chosen for you? <laughs> what did you think of the whole, um, I guess it's adding to what we talked about still, but the performative aspect of the communication between, or let me say, I didn't fully follow it, that why do they have conversations with each other if they know how it's going to go? They do talk to, uh, like, humans perceive sequentially they perceive simultaneously but with each other i think they still have like, the fact that they have a mechanism of communication that was touched upon a little bit in the story um i didn't fully understand why <laughs> why that was necessary was it perhaps because they knew eventually they'd come to talk to the aliens and so they need to communicate with them or was it um the performative aspect that she thinks about i didn't i I can't say i fully understood i wanted to see what you both thought about that that would confuse me too Uh, i wasn't sure what the point of that was i thought maybe they were communicating with each other in that way to make the humans feel more comfortable Mm. Uh, kind of like familiarity just to make just to not seem threatening or to not feel uh, kind of to um to relate to them in some way that they're they're like us they're talking to each other but i didn't understand beyond that i wasn't sure if i was missing something or Mm -hmm. if there was another point to all that yeah yeah i feel like i missed a few steps in that (laughs) line of reasoning there yeah cool yeah i I glossed over that as well i was kind of (laughs) like yeah there's other things to concentrate in the story i think that's where i sort of looked at it yeah 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 were there any other closing thoughts before uh, we wrap up this discussion? I'm kind of surprised that it's such a, I think it's, I guess it's a short story. It was like novella length almost, 60 pages. Mm-hmm. But I'm surprised you can pack so much into such a short story. And Chris, to your point earlier, the, the job they did on the, on the film, I mean, 
Jeez. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's it's even more impressive now that I've read the, the story. Yeah. I, I love like it. It was like, wow, that's what they were able to do with this to 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 convey the story to tell the story they did with the movie and just all the way around with great performances and visuals and everything else. But I think if some alien if some ship showed up, who would be the first people to try and blow them up, right? Oh, <laughs> I just wonder how that would how that would go. But uh no, I think it's uh yeah, I it's uh lots lots of uh lots of things packed into this one. Yeah, yeah. I did I did feel like at least in the beginning the physicist was there just so we'd have a character who can play the role of the reader and <laughs> have the linguistics explained to us, but yeah. Other than that, I, I I was also pretty happy with what a faithful adaptation it seemed to be, but also cutting out stuff that wasn't strictly necessary, I suppose. Yep. Um, I'm I'm guessing they cut some of the science out just to make it more accessible. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Whether that's right or wrong, it's probably one of the decisions they they wanted to make it. Uh, you know, for, so numbskulls like me won't get confused. <laughs> People of average intelligence, yeah, uh, but they, they they did they were able to keep because of the way the story is written and because of the way the linguistics actually worked visually, they were able to actually keep the heart of that in in the mm. story as well, which is kind of again to its great credit, not kind of thinking oh that's too complicated, let's make it a different type of <laughs> of mm. science in, in in the film. They didn't feel the need. To. Yeah, yeah, and it retained the. Is this just a thing that sci-fi authors do where they talk about world cooperation in difficult times? Because uh, Andy Weir does that too, but Hollywood movies tend to just show the one country fighting <laughs> against all odds. Uh, but yeah, I like that yeah. bit for sure. So cool. Yeah. Uh, in about a week from now, we will meet again uh, to discuss the short stories the Tower of Babylon and Division by Zero, uh, both from this story collection, Stories of Your Life, uh, by Ted Chang. And uh, yeah, Steve, where can people find you in the meantime? Uh, the best place is on, you can find all of us on pagejewing.com. Visit our forums. We have a blog that we'll be posting these episodes on, I'm sure. But yeah, come on and say hi and join us for a discussion and yeah, be fun. And Chris, <laughs> uh, you can find me on YouTube channel, which is just my name, Chris Moen. Uh, but you might find me talking about too many movies for that. Uh, so if you want to talk books and things like that, find me on the Patreon forums. Indeed, as, Pete, as Steve quite rightly said. Cool. Yeah, and I'll be on the Patreon forum too. Come find us there. Join us in these discussions or any of the I don't know five other read-alongs we've got going at the moment. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see everyone in about a week. Bye.